Good morning, Crystal Stevens. We're going to be starting here shortly. We're going to get started here in about two or three minutes. Just give everybody a chance to get on. Good morning, this is Osborne. Good morning. We're we'll starting here in about two minutes. Go get you a cup of coffee and come back and meet me in First Samuel 25. Good morning. Good morning. We'll be starting here in about a minute and a half. Let everybody know that we are live. We can share the feed. Good morning, everyone. 
We're so thankful that you could join us this morning for the morning meditation with God. Um, I'm Brother John Poo Malone, um, filling in for Brother Stevenson. Um, he's doing just fine. Um, he's just having some problems with his uh, Facebook, so he's not able to log in. Um, so y'all just pray that he gets that situated uh, really, really quickly. Um, but I'm filling in for him this morning. Um, the morning meditation I got with God is brought to you by the Midwest Church of Christ in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, that is at 2115 Garland Avenue there in Louisville. Um, and we're so thankful to be able to bring you the word of God first thing in the morning that help you get your day started off right to where you can go forward and be able to deal with the things that life throws at you. Um, we have service times on Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Um, please join us. Um, we also have a Wednesday morning Bible study at 10 a.m. and Wednesday night Bible study at 6.50 p.m. We'd love for you to join us there at 2115 Garland Avenue. We're following all the CDC guidelines. Everything is sanitized regularly. Um, everybody wears masks. You're able to you get um, your temperature checked and all of the whole nine when you come in. So everything is safe. Um, but if you don't feel safe, you can watch us online um, via our Facebook page on Facebook Live. Um, and we're actually working towards getting it on our YouTube page as well. But right now you can watch it um, on Facebook Live. Um, all you gotta do is go to uh, www.facebook.com slash Midwest COC, which many of you are not to do because you're doing that right now. Um, you can also participate in our Bible class via teleconference call. That number is 515-603-3169. And the access code is 414-167-POUND. Um, if you're going to be uh, watching online, you can come and pick up your communion um, at the church building. Um, Wednesday through Friday from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock and Saturday from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Um, please come and pick that up. And when you come and pick up your communion packets, you can also drop off your collection. Um, we, we are appreciative to all those that have still been giving during this pandemic and have make, been making sure that God gets his first fruits. Um, so you can drop off your, uh, your collection when you pick up your communion. You can also um, request that somebody drop your communion off at your home. Um, and you we can you can give your uh, your collection that way um, if you're not able to get out um, you can also give via um, um, our website give online just go to the donate tab and go, and give via PayPal and you can also give um, via uh, cash app uh, the cash app just um, put in the right information and you can uh, give that way um, but we appreciate all those that have have been giving regularly. Um, you've been doing a great job with that. And we ask that you continue. If you'd like to have a personal Bible study with us, call 502-774-3986. Once again, that number is 502-774-3986. And we can either set up a Bible study uh, in your home or we can set you up with the Bible correspondence course by mail. Um, we just love to teach you. It's important that we get into the word and know what, what thus saith the Lord. In any way, we can we can accommodate you to where you can get a better understanding of the word. We'd, uh, we'd love to be able to do that. So please take advantage of that. Um, we're thankful for all those who donate to help make this program happen. Um, we couldn't do this without you. Um, I don't have the list. Um, but all those that, that contribute, some people contribute pr pretty regularly. We It doesn't go unnoticed. And we really appreciate you um, setting that aside and helping us to spread the word of God um, uh, via this medium. A um, couple quick announcements for Mid uh, Midwest in-house announcements. Um, we're excited um, for everything that's coming up next month. Um, we're getting into our, our 100 year celebration. We're going to have one month of celebration. Um, starting in a few weeks, we'll be having activities um, pretty much weekly leading into our um, official 100 year celebration um, the first weekend in November. And we're excited for that. We're thankful for how God has kept Midwest 100 years. That's a huge accomplishment. It's hard to do something for 100 days, <laughs> let alone 100 years. And to be able to be utilized by God for such a long period of time, we're excited for that. Um, to help commemorate that, we want you to sign up for 
um, the Midwest Centennial um, Directory. Um, we need you to come get your picture taken. Um, Minister Wayne Shemwell, he's been doing a great job getting those pictures taken. Um, and we'd love for you to be able to come. Um, uh, schedule a time with Sister Claudia McGill. Um, there's uh, many dates between now um, and the, uh, I think, and the 10th of October, if I'm not mistaken. There's plenty of dates open. Um, if you have to come after work, you can come after work. There's time slots for that as well. But please uh, get with Sister Claudia McGill and schedule your appointment. Um, also, just looking at some of the events that we have coming up in that one month of celebration, on Saturday, October the 10th, we'll be having a uh, congregational singing there at the Midwest Church. Um, if you'd like to be there, we'd love for you to be there. We have um, some guest song leaders coming from Nashville that'll be leading our hearts in song. Um, so we'd love for you to attend and just have a good old shouting good time in the Lord. And that is Saturday, October the 10th at 12 o'clock. Um, and that Sunday, we're very excited. We will be installing um, new leadership um, there at the Midwest Church. We are blessed to have other men in our congregation who are willing to join our current leadership in the work of the Lord. After a series of training sessions, it's our plan to ordain the following men as leaders at our congregation. Uh, Brother uh, Robert Jordan will be installed as an elder. Uh, Brother Tony Burton, Brother Tony Curry, Brother Richard Curry, Brother Dwayne McGill, and Brother Gary Simonton will be installed as deacons. And that will be on, on uh, Sunday, October the 11th. Um, and we love for you to be able to attend and be a part of history on that day. Um, and we have several other events that will be coming up as well. Um, so just watch for those announcements. The food ministry will be open each Monday, I mean, each month on the second and fourth Thursday. Um, and we also had a special um, food pantry yes on um, yesterday morning. Was it yesterday morning? I believe, yes, yes uh, yesterday morning um, there at the church. And I think we will have another one two weeks uh, from now. So please um, take advantage of those opportunities um, and everything that is going on. Um, we're going to um, say a prayer at this time. want to make sure that we always remember our sick and our shut-in. Um, we say a special prayer for Sister Jackie Holman, Sister Clarice Johnson, Sister Emma Johnson, Sister Tanya Lee, uh, Sister Domery Sizemore, Sister Felicia Stevenson, Sister Jackie Thomas, as they're battling sickness, um, and also uh, Brother Wesley and Angela Keys and Angelo Pendergrass um, as they're dealing with sickness. We also want to make sure we pray for our shut-in. Um, that's Sister Louise Covington, Sister Sarah Cowan, Sister Mary Hunter, Sister Vanna Johnson, Sister Opal Pace, Sister Pearl Smith, Sister Mary Wood, and Brother James Fraser and his wife, Sister Bertha Fraser, as she's taking care of him. We're going, to God, we're going to go to God in prayer at this time. Dear most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you so much for how you bless us, for the opportunity to call you, Father, for the opportunity to be able to study your word and come together as your child, dear God. We don't take that opportunity lightly. We know it's a privilege, and we love you for that, dear God. But we ask a special prayer um, for those that are listening. Give us a mind, uh, a heart to receive what you have for us, dear God. We ask a special prayer for um, uh, for your word to just pen pen penetrate our hearts, dear God. Just work in this, dear God. I pray that you work through me to where the people receive you and not me, dear God. Father, we love you and we thank you so much. In Jesus' sweet and precious name, we do ask this prayer. Amen. All right. So this morning, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 25. I'm just picking up where Brother um, Stevenson left off. Um, so meet me there, 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter. 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter. Um, the last time uh, Brother Stevenson was on, he he started the beginning of this chapter. And in this chapter, we're seeing uh, David. Um, uh, David is growing. Um, you, you've been in 1 Samuel for a while. And you've seen his progression. Um, you see um, David go from a little shepherd boy um, to being a, a, a worker in, San, in Saul's uh, court. You see him serving Saul. You see him as a musician, but then he starts growing and he becomes a warrior and you see him in that capacity. And now he's continuing to progress and he's getting closer and closer to realizing his destiny um, that way back in chapter 16. Remember in chapter 16, God sent the prophet Samuel to him in order to anoint him to be king. 
And so his destiny is to be king of Israel. His destiny is to lead God's people. Um, but he has to progress and he has to develop into that. You can't just walk into your destiny overnight. You have to allow yourself time to progress and for God to work on you. Um, and that's really important for a lot of us who are trying to get to our destiny and who are trying to grow and, 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 and do greater things. Um, than we have in the past. You can't get there overnight. You have to grow. Um, life life has a way of molding you. God you, utilizes your trials and your tribulations and even the good things in order to prepare you for where he's taking you to. Um, that's what equips you. And so by the time you get to chapter 25, David has got has <laughs> had some run-ins with Saul. Um, I believe in chapter 24, um, Saul had, had gotten jealous to the point to where he is uh, chasing David, trying to kill him. Um, so David was on the run. <laughs> um, David was having to hide in caves and things of that nature. Um, but what I like about David is David never lost his integrity. David was always a stand-up guy. Um, and I want to make sure I make this point because you're going to see in chapter 25, um, David gets tired of being a stand-up guy <laughs> and doing the right thing in chapter 25. But in chapter 24, he was a really stand-up guy and he was in he spared Saul's life when everybody was saying, this is your time. Now it's your time to kill the king. Um, now you're about to walk into your kingdom. And David kept David kept telling him, he's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to become king when God makes it happen. God didn't deliver Saul into my hand to kill him right now. He, God will make it happen. I'm not going to, I'm not going to touch God's anointed. That was his, his, his MO throughout this whole process. And what's interesting is David had that spirit, but Saul was just so threatened. Um, by the end of chapter 24, Saul was like, okay, I'm going to stop trying to kill you. But then when you get to chapter 26, he's trying to kill him again. Um, <laughs> so it's just really interesting just seeing the dynamic between David as as the as God's anointed and Saul as God's anointed because Saul had this um this spirit of he was just always threatened that somebody was trying to take his position he was always worried that somebody was coming for him um he couldn't handle David being uh, uplifted he couldn't handle the people praising David um he just he had a spirit of jealousy and so God couldn't use him cuz and another he had, he had a spirit of disobedience he wanted to do things his way, and so God had to get rid of him. And so God is really, during this time period, right, raising up David for that moment. And so when you get to chapter 25, a couple of significant things happen, which I think y'all talked about last time. Right off the bat in chapter 25, verse 1, Samuel passes away. Um, and remember Samuel, Samuel was the last judge in Israel. He's the one that actually um, transitioned the people of God from judges to kings. Um, he was the one that anointed King Saul and he's the one that anointed King David. He was that last piece to that last generation. Um, and that last, um, I guess you could call it a dispensation if you wanted to. Um, he's that last piece to that time period. Um, and so now that he's gone, David has, David and Saul, they've lost their advisor. They've lost their counsel. Now they're having to look at this thing. Um, without Samuel. So it's a, it's a kind of an interesting time of transition because you see God moving from how he used to do things to how he's doing things now. Um, and somebody watching this right now is in transition. God is transitioning you um, from an old way of thinking or an old way of life to something new that's um, unprecedented that you've not experienced before. And the question is, how are you going to handle it? Um, it was easy to keep your integrity back then. Um, in that not in that time in that um, way of life, can you keep your integrity now? Can God continue to count on you and use you now in the transition? Um, transition is difficult. I think for a lot of people, twenty twenty has been a year of transition for them. Um, for a lot of people, um, just having to cut you you you're in solitude. A lot of us because we're in quarantine um, and outside is all kind of crazy stuff going on anyway. So you kind of try to stay to yourself. And it's in this moment we talked about it in my Bible study last night. Um, and this it's in this time period where in your solitude, God is trying to speak to you and make sure that you can hear him clearly, because a lot of times we lose the voice of God in the noise of life. And so sometimes God has to break us down and get us by ourselves in order for us to be able to hear him so he can transition us. And so make sure that you that you you can see when you're in transition. 
it's a scary place when you're in transition and don't realize it. Because what tends to happen when you're in transition and don't know it, you'll you'll keep trying to do the same things, but they won't work anymore. <laughs> you'll keep trying to do the same things, but they won't work anymore. So you'll be trying to do uh, plant seed in the ground in a different type of terrain and it won't, nothing will grow. And so you have to make sure that you are connected with God and know when he's transitioning you. And so um, last, uh, last time you all spoke, David had been talking with um, a man named, he sent messengers to a man named Nabal. Um, Nabal literally is tra uh, translated as a fool. Um, so this guy's trouble, <laughs> um, in other words. Um, and what's happened is um, David had taken some time to really take care of Nabal's people. Um, he made sure that Nabal's people and Nabal's uh, uh, um, uh, livestock and things, they had everything had been taken care of and that they didn't get destroyed because there was a lot, there was a history of raids in that uh, area during that time period. So David made sure that he kept uh, Nabal's things safe. Um, and so now David is coming, at, uh, it's a time period, this is the time of the sheep shearing. Um, a couple of things you need to know about the time of the sheep shearing. Um, during this time, this was a time of prosperity. This was basically if you had sheep or you had livestock and things of that nature, the, the time of the sheep shearing was when was basically your harvest. Um, you know, if you were a farmer, you have a season where you plant seed and then you have a season where you have harvest. And so there's a lot of harvest celebration and harvest feast and harvest festivals because what was going on, you were celebrating how God has provided because now you are prospering. You're able to sell um, and, and have substance. Well, during the time of the sheep shearing, it's the same concept. During this time period is a time where they were able to shear their sheep, where they're able to have um they're able to have a product to where they can sell. And so they're producing and they're making money. And so this was a time of great generosity historically. Um, as far as things go, um, culturally during that time, it was a time of great generosity. People were supposed to give during this time. If you asked them for something, they would try their best to get it for you um, because it was just that time period. Everybody celebrated. You had feasts and parties and things. So it was just a really good time. And so Nabal, being a sheep shearer, it was time for him to prosper. The thing is, in his prosperity, David shows up and he sends messengers to him. And he's like, listen, um, I need you to pay back the favor that I gave you. Remember, I took care of your people and I made sure that your folks um, had everything that they needed and that they didn't um, that they didn't get hurt out there. Um, I just I, and I need you to do the same for me. Um, in particular, he says something. He says, uh, where is it? Um, he says, ask your men and they will tell you that it's true that I took care of them. Verse number eight. He says, please share any provisions you may have on hand with us and with your friend, David. Um, and so he was basically, whatever, you, if you could hey, just help us out right now, if you could just help us out, we greatly appreciate it because we helped you out. You, I scratch your back, you scratch mine type of situation. The problem is, like I said, Nabal was a jerk. <laughs> he was not a nice guy. Um, and he started getting smart. He was like, who is this David dude? Like, um, who um, is this son of Jesse? He started insulting him. He insulted him to the point to where he said, um, he's probably just a runaway slave. They're, they're slaves that run away from their masters. Why in the world would I give any food to somebody like that? He says, "I basically, I work for mine. He can work for his. It's real, he really insulted David because, number one, he definitely knew who David was because David was very famous. <laughs> By this point, remember, David was a famous and decorated warrior defeating Goliath and things. So it's not like David was this nobody that he didn't know. He knew David. What he was basically saying was, who does David think he is that he's going to ask me for my stuff? And I think the, a sign of true character is how you treat people when you prosper. I think that's a sign of true character. Um, it's easy to be nice to people and to treat people right when you have nothing. It's easy to take advantage of other people's niceness and other people's love. It's easy for uh, uh, um, for you to be, uh, to say, you know what? Um, uh, let me let me let me pro let me let me let me mooch, for lack of a better term, off of your prosperity. Um, well, right now, now he has something, but he's not being generous back. 
a lot of times what we what will happen is when we're in our season where we are in need, we're the nicest, most God fearing people. We will help anybody with everything because that we're just in that position. But once we get something, we forget who we are. We forget those that helped us and we don't look back and we just we have this negative energy around us to where nobody. How often have you heard somebody say, well, I got mine. I need to get theirs. No, baby, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I'm not saying that you enable people. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is you have to have a spirit to give. You have to have a spirit to help. You have to have a spirit to pour into others. Because somebody said it like this. Somebody said, yo, you got your hand closed so tight, can't nothing get in and can't nothing get out. <laughs> Which means that the only way you have room to receive more is if you pour out. And so Nabal had this spirit where he was like, I ain't, I ain't doing it. Um, and he insulted David and he meant to insult David. He wanted to make David upset. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> David got upset and he got his people together and he was like, I'm about to go in and I'm about to wipe him out. <laughs> He's like, I'm about to kill folk. He said, he said, if, 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 all of Nabal's people ain't wiped out by morning. Let God kill me. David was hot. And I, I said that because remember, I told you at the beginning of this, David has a history of being a stand up guy. He's really good at not holding grudges. He's really good at forgiveness. He's really good at letting go and not being vengeful. But at this point, David is just tired of doing the right thing. And I don't know about y'all. Sometimes you just get tired of doing the right thing. <laughs> I don't know if you're like me. Um, I try to be spiritual and I try to do what God tells me to do. And I have a lot of growing to do. Um, but I, I try to, you know, let uh, let stuff go by and, and not be vengeful and not get angry. I try really hard to do that. And when you do it for so long, sometimes it's difficult. Um, maybe David, remember David, he, he came up in Saul's house. So David had somewhat of a relationship with Saul to where, remember, he trained under Saul and he worked with Saul and he comforted Saul and he knew Saul's pains. Remember, he came into Saul's house because Saul, <laughs> excuse me, because Saul um, was struggling with the evil spirit and he needed comfort. That's why. So maybe David just had a heart for Saul to where he was able to take more from Saul because he understood Saul had issues and he had a relationship. So he said, you know what? I can forgive you, Saul. I can let this go, Saul, because I have a love for you, Saul. But right here, you have Nabal, who David don't know from the man in the moon and in all reality. He's like, I ain't taking this from you. <laughs> and that's how some of us are. We'll do good with our family. Our family will treat us like dirt, but we'll learn how to forgive them and to let things go. But let somebody make you mad at the church and you stop coming to church altogether because we get tired of doing the right thing. Um, and so what you're going to see into this morning's lesson, and I'm sorry, I, need, I just wanted to set that up. What you're going to see in this morning's lesson is God has to remind David of who he is. He has to remind David of what what um, is at stake here. Um, and so what you're going to see is God is going to utilize Nabal's wife, Abigail, in order to remind David of who he is. And so when you get to chapter, I mean, verse number 18, get to verse number 18, um, Nabal's people had went to Abigail because they said, listen, um, David is about to come and kill all of us <laughs> and your husband won't listen. So maybe you can do something. Um, and so when when Abigail heard this in verse number 18, uh, 1 Samuel 25, verse number 18, if you're just joining us, 1 Samuel 25, verse number 18, if you're just joining us, the Bible says um, from the NLT version, Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wine skins full of wine, Five sheep that have been slaughtered, nearly a bushel of roasted grain, a hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred fig cakes. She packed them on donkeys and said to her servants, Go on ahead, I will follow shortly. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal what she was doing. Now, a couple of things there. You saw all the stuff that she gathered, all this bread and sheep and all this kind of stuff. She pulled all this together at a moment's notice. That shows how prosperous Nabal was. He was a very rich man. 
They were very well-off people. And so it took no time to get these things together um, because they just had it on hand. I just wanted you to see how blessed these people really are. And for them to be that blessed and Nabal not care to pour into anybody else just shows how messed up of a spirit he had. Um, but Abigail got all these things together because basically because her husband would not. All right. Um, and she said, y'all go on ahead. I, but she did not tell Nabal what was going on. Um, sometimes you can't tell everybody what you're doing because everybody ain't, they ain't got the right spirit. I'll say that again. Sometimes you can't tell everybody what you're doing because everybody don't have the right spirit. So if you tell them what's going on, they'll try to bring down, they'll try to stop your progress. All right. So she said, I can't tell him. If I tell him he's going to stop me, I got to do this on my own. Oh my God. Sometimes you got to do some stuff on your own. Sometimes you got to go into your secret closet and have some time with God and do some things on your own. Um, but anyway, verse number 20. As she was riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, she saw David and his men coming toward her. So she sees David before David sees her. Um, David had just finished going off. He was upset. David had just finished saying a lot of good it did to me to help this dude. He, well, this is the poo version. A lot of good it did for me to help this dude. We protected his flocks in the wilderness and nothing he owned was lost or stolen, but he repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow. He was hot. He said, what sense did it make for me to treat this guy with favor, to do this for him and be nice to him? I did all this for him and he ain't going to give me nothing. He going to repay me evil for my good. And this is, that's how so many of us feel right now. We feel like people are repaying our, uh, our good with evil. We do all the right things. We say the right things. We take care of people. It could be our kids or our grandkids. We're taking care of them and trying to make sure that they have what they need and show them love and to discipline them and help them grow. But they show us nothing but contempt and attitude and resentment. And you're like, I'm doing you a favor. I'm show, I'm doing this for you because I love you. And this is how I'm repaid. You do your job right and you go to work every day and you do what you're supposed to do and you get your job done and you do it with, with a smile and you, um, you submit to your superiors and you do all the right things and you follow all the rules, but some kind of way you still get passed over for that promotion. And you're like, what is going on? Or you still get laid off when layoffs happen. And you're, you're frustrated because you're like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm treating you right. I'm being nice. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm not coming here with an attitude all the time. Why in the Lord are you repaying me evil for my good? I don't know what else to do. I was working a job. I'll never forget. I was working a job. I, I was a teacher. And, um, I had a principal that, and I, I was, I had a great music program and I was really developing and doing what I needed to do. The city loved me. The school board loved me. Um, I was doing all the right stuff, but I had this principal who was always just trying to put me in my place. It was like, she had this thing where she had to always remind me that she was in charge <laughs> and it used to get on my last night. I'm like, I don't know what else to do. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm following the book. Why am I getting called into your office? If a, when a parent, uh, instead of a parent calling me, they go over my head and they talk to her and then, then I'm, I'm in trouble. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know what else to do. And somebody feels just like that today. That's where David was. He was like, I am sick and tired of doing the right thing. Sometimes I ain't one of those preachers that's going to tell you that doing the right thing feels good. A lot of times it does not. Let's just be real. A lot of times doing the right thing and turning the other cheek and doing what God told you to do does not feel good. Sometimes it feels much better to tell that person off and get it all out and let make them feel about that big and walk off. Man, that feels good. <laughs> it feels good. And to and to turn the other cheek and say, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to let you have this and I'm going to let God handle it. Doesn't feel good because sometimes God doesn't handle situations the way we want him to. Sometimes God, I'm not saying God doesn't handle situations. I said God does not handle them the way we would like him to. 
We would like him to jump in and deal with them and maybe take their job away or maybe do this and maybe do that. And we're like, God, go ahead. Let them get it. Vengeance is mine. Stay at the Lord. And sometimes what God will do, he'll let them keep their position. Matter of fact, he may even elevate them and give them a promotion or he'll he'll make things even better for their life. And we just get frustrated because we're like, God, you're supposed to knock them down a few pegs. And God is like, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to knock them down. I'm trying to elevate you. And what you need to understand Somebody said it like this. I like I like this this thought process. Somebody said when 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 uh, there was a guy in a hole, or it may have been a dog in a hole. I don't, I don't remember the story that good. I'm not good at telling stories. Um, but there was some something in a hole, and he couldn't get out. Um, he was stuck in. He had got gotten in too deep, but he needed to get out, and there was not a ladder. There wasn't anybody to be able to pull him out. And so what he did was he scraped the dirt off of the off the wall and he put that dirt under his feet and what happened is the more dirt he got and the more he packed it under his feet the higher he got to where eventually he had gotten high enough to where he could get out the hole and what God is trying to do he's trying to utilize these other folks dirt to elevate you um, he's trying to utilize these. If you can just shake the dirt off of you and put it under your feet, eventually you'll go higher. And so what you're looking for God to do is to make the hole smaller. No, God ain't trying to make the hole smaller. He's trying to elevate you to where you can climb out. And so right here, David is frustrated, basically, in other words. And Abigail rides up and hears him complaining. Um, verse number 23 of 1 Samuel 25, if you're just joining us. 1 Samuel 25, I'm on verse number 23. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and she bowed low before him. She fell at his feet. I want you to really see this thing because she's somebody who is well off, well established. The Bible talks about how earlier in the chapter, how beautiful she is and intelligent, how she has all of these things and all these resources. She's probably never bowed to anybody a day in her life. She comes off of her donkey and she bows down. And the first thing she says is, I accept all the blame in this matter, my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. Oh, she said, you know what? I'm going to take the blame for the for the mess that my husband has created. That sounds a lot like Jesus, don't it? Where God is ready to punish us. And God is ready to wipe us out. And Jesus steps in the middle and he says, no, 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 don't, 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 don't do it. They know me. I'll take that blame. That's what he did on the cross. On the cross was him taking the blame for everything that we did. My God, my God, that's good news. He's taking the blame. He said, I know, um, I know who did it. I know who messed up, but I'm going to take his punishment. I'm going to take the blame for that. I know, I know you did. I know that person messed up, but I'm going to take that punishment because I don't want to see them die. What I like about Abigail, even though her husband was not a good guy, she loved her husband and the people around her, all our servants. She loved the people enough to say, I will lay my life down in order for you all to be able to live. She was like, I'll, I take the blame. Please accept it and listen to what I have to say. Verse number 25, I know Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. <laughs> Please don't pay any attention to him. He's a fool just like his name suggests. Um, <laughs> she's basically like, David, please. I know my husband is a problem. <laughs> I know he's messed up, but don't pay attention to him. Listen to me, all right? I'm I'm in, I'm wonder how she ended up in this relationship in the first place. I'm sure a lot of it back then, you know, was arranged marriage and things of that nature. But for her to be just so beautiful and so intelligent and so selfless and so God fearing, for her to be like that and to be with with this spiteful and evil and wicked and just foolish guy, it's such a a terrible thing. And honestly, there's a lot of people in this world who are living in relationships like that. Um, and I don't want to go on this tangent about, about dating and marriage, but really make sure that you watch who you're affiliating yourself with. You don't want to mess around and end up attached to somebody um, who don't mean you no good. Somebody that's going to be a detriment to you, that's going to put you um, in danger, for lack of a better term. They're going to hold you back and keep you from being able to progress. Make sure that you're with somebody who loves God and is trying to please God just like you are. 
Um, but she said, don't pay attention to him. She said, I, she says, she keeps explaining. I've never even saw the young man that you sent that, um, that talked to, um, my man. All I know is that surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, um, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be cursed as Nabal is. I want you to see this is so good. When you're trying to change somebody's mind and help them make a better decision, for many of us, it's easy just to tell them that they're doing things wrong and to get it together. What I like about Abigail, she didn't just attack David and tell him why he was wrong. What she did, she appealed to what was right in David. Um, she said, the fact that you haven't murdered him yet and taken vengeance yet, that just shows that God is with you. God has kept you from killing us. Um, knowing good and well that David had every intention to kill everybody and wipe everybody out, she appealed to the goodness that's in him. And sometimes I want to help somebody who's trying to maybe direct their child or direct their spouse or they're trying to help change somebody's spirit or attitude on the job or whatever. When you're dealing with people and you're trying to help them grow and help them be better, don't attack them. When you get attacked, you don't respond positively. You have to make sure that you appeal to the good qualities in them. So if somebody is always, say they're always running late and they can't ever be on time and it's messing up your workflow, you could just like, you're always late, get it together, da, 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 da. And that may work. But if you could appeal to their, to their goodness, saying things like, you know what? Um, I know you probably have a difficult time getting here, but I know, I know your heart is here and you really want to be here. Um, so at whatever we can do to help you grow and be more on time and be more da, 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 da. I don't know, but speak to them. What's the pro, pro I think the pro, proverb says something about words being sweetened with honey. Um, you got to make sure that you that your words are sweetened. Um, that's how you get people to receive from you. Stop going off all the time. Church folk, especially church folk, is good about just telling folk why they're wrong. Well, we we don't realize this, but a, a lot of church folk operate like the old law. The Bible talks about how how the old law and the law of Moses. It could tell you what's wrong with you, but not tell you how to fix it. Um, but Jesus came to where he could actually fix it. And a lot of us operate like, like like the old law. We just go off and tell you that you're wrong, tell you that you don't look good, tell you that your clothes don't fit. We tell you that. Da, 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 da. We just go off. Um, but at some point, you have to walk people through how to be better. Um, and so what Abigail was doing with David, she was almost using like a reverse psychology on him to help appeal to his heart. Um, verse number 27 of 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25, verse number 27, if you're just joining us. Um, she says, here is a present that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with the lasting dynasty, for you are fighting the Lord's battles and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. So she's basically saying, David, you have a history of doing what God called you to do. Any battle that you fight has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. You only you only fight the battles that God leads you into. You don't go and create trouble. You don't go and take back vengeance. You you have a history throughout your entire life of doing the right thing on behalf of God. And I know that's not going to be any different now. Sometimes you have to be reminded of who you are. You are a child of God. You and I know it's tiring. And I know you're worn out and, and you're, you're uncomfortable and you're frustrated because it seems like doing the right thing is not doing anything for you. But understand and know that anytime you're working for God, if you don't faint, you will reap. <laughs> and so you just got to keep on moving. You got to keep on trucking and keep letting God use you. Don't start changing your, your spirit now. Don't change it now. I know you feel like you've been in this valley for too long. Don't change. All right, you're, you're doing the right thing. Verse number 29. She said, even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. So now she starts appealing to his, to his, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
to to his memory, for lack of a better term, she's basically she says, "I know that sometimes you're you're chased." Um, I don't know if she really knew how how Saul had been trying to kill him, or if God was giving her a word that she didn't even understand. But she was she said, "Even though when you're chased by people who want to kill you, God keeps you safe." Just he says, "Your your lives, the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling." She's appealing to his thought process because remember, when he was younger, he defeated Goliath with a, a, a rock from a sling. So she's appealing to, to what he knows. She's, she's reminding him, remember how, and in, in, in so many words, you remember how God delivered you from the hands of Goliath and how he delivered you from the hand of Saul? Like, like he'll do it again. So don't worry about Naples. You don't have to kill us. God will handle it. You don't have to worry about that. God will handle it. Verse number 30. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this blemish be on your record. Then your conscience will have to hear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. Uh, so he, she was like, eventually, if you keep if you keep on the right track, God is going to make you king of here, here in Israel. I don't know if she knew about his anointing. I don't know how she knew this. I don't know if God would just sent a word through her and she was just a... Um, uh, on the spot prophet. I'm not sure, but we do know she said, God is going to make you king. And when God makes you king and leader in Israel, you don't want to have this memory of this senseless bloodshed on your record. You don't want to have this on your conscience. When you go into your kingdom, you want to be able to say, I've done, I've, I've done the right thing. I've done what God has called me to do. You don't want to have any kind of guilt on you. <sighs> A lot of us we're going into our next season guilty. We're going into our next season um, with this guilt on us. You got to get rid of the guilt. You have to do all that you can to get rid of this bitterness and get rid of all the anger and get rid of all the frustration. Because if you take that to your next level, it has the potential to, to take you out of your next level. So you got to make sure that you get rid of that stuff. That's why in Ephesians chapter four, if I'm not mistaken, the Bible says, uh, get rid of all bitterness all wrath and all envy. Get rid of all that because you don't want to take that to the next level. You can't take that to the next level. If you take that, it'll weigh you down and you'll end up back where you started. That's why in Hebrews, I believe in chapter 10 or 12, somewhere around there, it says you got to make sure that you take off every weight and sin that easily besets us. There's a lot of us, some people, some of us have sin. We do, and we have to get rid of sin. We have to alleviate that. We have to mortify the deeds of the body and obey God. We do have to get rid of sin. But a lot of us have don't have sin. We have weight. He said you have to get rid of every sin and weight. So it's not just the people with sin problems that, that, are, that are stagnant. It's those of us that got weight. Weight is anything that holds you down. So that's bitterness. That's anger. That's fear. That's uh, 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 envy greed, all of these, these are things that keep you weighed down to where you cannot progress. Some of us, we're doing okay in life, but we could do so much better if we learn how to let stuff go. And I say that kind of thing a lot. I, I talk a lot about letting go. At some point, you got to learn how to let go. That happened 10 years ago, boo-boo. <laughs> that happened 20 years ago and you're still hanging on to that? You're still letting that upset you when that when that person walks into the room, your spirit still shifts. And that's been 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. At some point, you got to let it go. I know they said this. I know they didn't do what they were supposed to do. I know they let you down. But at some point, you got to let go. Well, they were my parents and they had a responsibility. They did, but they didn't do it. So what's how what is you being mad going to do? How does that change anything? Well, they shouldn't have done this to me or da da da. How, what is you being mad change? They ain't even thinking about it no more. They moving on with their life. You're the one that's stagnant. You're the one that can't have a meaningful relationship. You're the one that's working a, a meaningless job that you don't like. You're the one that's spinning your wheels. You're the one that don't know how to show love. So what is you being mad and holding this against them do? It doesn't do anything but make you miserable. Learn how to let it go. Let go and let God. And so she says one more thing in verse number 31. She says, when the Lord does these great things for you, please remember me, your servant. So you're mad at Nabal. I want you to see this. 
you're upset with Nabal because Nabal, after you did these great things for him, he does not, he forgotten you. He doesn't want to do anything great for you. She's basically saying this, when God does great things for you, don't forget me. That's really, really, really good. What you, the same thing that you expect of Nabal, I'm expecting of you. Be careful when you hold somebody to a standard that you don't want to hold yourself to. My God, my God. I'm going to say that again. Make sure that you be careful when you hold yourself, when you hold someone else to a standard that you don't want to hold yourself to. Um, it's like where the Bible talks about where you can see the speck in somebody else's eye, but you have a whole plank in your eye. Be careful when you're holding people to a standard. Um, in Acts chapter 15, the Jewish Christians were trying to hold the, the, the Gentile Christians to the old law. They said you had to be circumcised and you have to keep this Sabbath and da, da 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 and all these things that you had to do according to the old law. Well, they had some discussion and Paul and Barnabas had some discussion back and forth with Peter and James. And eventually Peter got up and he said this in Acts chapter 15. He says, why in the world are we trying to hold the Gentiles to a standard that we're not even doing all the way right? We're trying to make them keep this law and we're not even fully keeping this law. So why are we going to put this weight and these shackles on them that we don't even want on ourselves? And you got to be careful when you're holding people to a standard that you wouldn't even hold yourself to. That is a scare. That is, it's, it's dangerous because what starts to happen is people start to feel it and they start resenting you. And that's where judgment comes in. Listen, the Bible says this whole thing where you can't judge me, only God can judge me. The Bible talks about righteous judgment and talks about how we have to be able to have, be able to have judgment. The Bible talks about how Christians will judge the earth. Um, we have to have a certain level of judgment. The issue is when your judgment becomes criticism. That's the difference. Because the Bible says judge not lest you be judged. Meaning if you're going to judge somebody else, make sure that you judge yourself first. So be careful when you are holding somebody else to a standard that you're not even holding yourself to. Um, so Abigail told David, listen, when God blesses you, you bless me. Just like you, just like when you bless Nabal, you wanted him to bless you. Verse number 32 of 1 Samuel 25, and we're getting close to the end. Um, Y'all can start typing in your prayer request if you would like. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, but verse number 32, David replied to Abigail, praise the Lord the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. So this is what I like about David. When David was reminded of who, what he was supposed to be doing and who God was and what he was supposed to doing, be doing with God, he welcomed the critique. <sighs> He welcomed the critique. He said, praise God that God sent you to me today. He realized that it wasn't Abigail who just came on on accord, but God sent Abigail to him because he realized he needed to be reminded of who he is. He says, thank God for your good sense and bless you from keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. At some point, you got to be grown enough to welcome and accept critique. At some point, you got to grow up enough to where you can receive critique. There are too many of us that don't like to be corrected. We don't want anybody to tell us what we can do better or, try, or bring up anything negative to us. We want everybody to say, you're doing a good job and you're justified in that. That's why we surround ourselves with the people that we surround ourselves with. We, most of us, surround, I can say most of us, but many of us surround ourselves with people who will just, who will co-sign on whatever we're feeling. So if we're upset, we surround ourselves with other people that are going to say, yeah, that person deserve it. If I were you, I'd do da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And all they do is boost our head and make us feel that much more upset and we ready to go off. But God is saying, you need to surround yourself with people who are going to call you out on your stuff and remind you of who you belong to and your purpose here on earth. You got to get make sure you're connected to some spiritual people. I'm going to say that again. Make sure that you are connected to some spiritual people. Get you a spiritual circle. You got to find some other people who are trying to move forward. Some other people who are trying to, to, to progress with, with God. You got to find you some other folk. Instead of surrounding yourself 
Listen, be careful when, when your circle is just people that you've always known and not people that God has sent to you. I'm going to say that again. Be careful when your circle, when your inner circle is simply people who you've always known and not people that God has sent to you. Your circle has to go beyond the familiar. It has to go to the spiritual. God sends people in your life to help make you better and to help refine you. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. He's trying to refine you and help you become better and help you become sharper. But the thing is, you you reject those people who would make you sharper and you keep standing around other dull people. It's like when at the pool, I think at the pool of Bethesda, there was all these people with different ailments and different sicknesses and afflictions. Um, and Jesus shows up and there's a man who's laying there lame, if I'm not mistaken. And he's like, why are you laying here? He said, don't you want to be made whole? And he said, well, every time I try to get into the into the water, somebody gets in front of me and there's nobody to put me in it. Of course, there's nobody to put you in it. Everybody else there got issues, too. <laughs> Everybody around you is broken. So why in the world are you around other broken people expecting them to be able to pick you up and put you in? You around other broken people and expecting them to be able to support you. Now, I'm not saying that you got to get around perfect people. I'm not saying that, but you got to get around spiritual people. What's the difference? Perfect people have no problems. Spiritual people have problems, but they know who to go to when they have problems. Um, they know that it's not in themselves. It's not a man to, that walketh to direct his own path. They know that they're supposed to trust in the Lord with all their heart and lean not to their own understanding. That's the spiritual person. Spiritual people are people who, who understand that they are victory. They are people who understand that they are, they're not looking for victory. They are victory. Remember, the Bible talked, uh, Jesus, when he went to the cross, he went to the cross and he said, death, where is thy sting when he rose? Grave, where is thy victory? We are the product of Christ's victory on the cross. So we're not looking for victory. We are victory. That's why the Bible says that we're more than conquerors because we are victorious. And so you have to get around people who can help strengthen you and support you and hold you up even when you can't because these people help refine you. And so David understood when Abigail came, this wasn't by happenstance. This wasn't just random. God sent you to me today and I'm thankful because if it had not been for you, I would have done something that I would have regret. I would have created, uh, committed murder and I would have carried out my own vengeance in my own hands and I would not have allowed God's will to be done. And I thank you for that, Abigail. I appreciate you. And we got to get people around us and we have to be able to accept the critique and appreciate the critique. Verse number 34. I'm getting, I'm about, I'm reading 34 and 35. He said, for I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept me from hurting you, that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. Then David accepted her present and told her, return home in peace. I have heard what you said. We will not kill your, excuse me, we will not kill your husband. You got to make sure that you hear what folks say too. <laughs> A lot of us can't accept a uh, critique because we won't, we can't hear what they're saying. We, we hear the negative and we hear um, the stuff that we don't like and we get upset and offended. Um, a friend of mine says you can either get offended or you can get the message. And a lot of us, we get we get offended and we don't hear what's how they're trying to help us. We don't hear the love. We don't hear the concern. We only hear that they're saying that I need to change something. And there are a lot of us that are so afraid to change that anytime somebody calls that to our attention, it freaks us out. And so we get defensive or there are there are some of us who we've worked really hard to get to where we are. And so for anybody to say that we still have more work to do, it makes us feel less than it makes us feel like people can see the real us. And it, and it, it, it shakes our foundation. We don't like to feel less than we don't like to feel like somebody is better than us or like we have like we have more work to do or that we didn't achieve our goal. And so as a result of that, we get upset. OK, um, we have a call on the radio station. We're going to take that call at this time. Yes, sir. Yeah. Go ahead, call. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Revival 
I'm sorry? Yes, sir. Oh, Brother Stevenson is out this morning. I'm um I'm filling in for him today. So, and we'll definitely keep you in prayer. Are there any other callers? And you can type your prayer request in because we're about to pray here in about 60 seconds. But um, Sister Marilyn Wester asks prayer for her family. Um, thank you all for listening. I pray that it's been a blessing to you. Um, I'm not sure. Hopefully, Brother Jerry will get, uh, get his things fixed today. If not, I'll be back with you in the morning. But hopefully, he'll be back with you all. Um, just uh, pray for uh, he'll be able to get everything situated with his Facebook page. Um, he's fine. His health is doing good. He's doing really good right now. Um, he's just having a problem with his Facebook being able to go live and log in. So just pray that he can get that alleviated. All right. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. Father God, we love you. and We thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word and to come together. Lord, we love you so much and we know that you're trying to make us better. We pray that we have a heart to receive your word this morning and that you'll use us, dear God. We ask a special prayer for Sister Wester as she's asking prayer for her family. Be with them. Ask a special prayer for Brother Barlow. He's uh, requesting prayer as well. You know what they need and specifically, and only you can give it to them. Lord, forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, dear God. In Jesus' sweet and precious name, we do ask this prayer. Amen. All right, God bless you all, and we'll see you later.